Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Tanaya Yarbrough Maxwell. We are now on Ezekiel 16. This is a pretty long chapter, so I'm going to go ahead and split it up into two lessons. And so Ezekiel 16, we will be doing today part one. If you guys are a couple, remember to go ahead and join us on our podcast. You can say that again. It will help change the dynamic of your marriage. I will post the link in the description and let's go ahead and get started. So Ezekiel 16, and we're going to start, of course, on verse 1 through 2. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. Okay. So if we look at the study Bible, again, I would highly recommend getting a study Bible. It truly gives you a deeper insight as you study the word, look on Google, all of those different things. So it says... This message reminded Jerusalem of its former despised status among the Canaanites' nations. Using the imagery of a young baby growing to mature womanhood, God reminded Jerusalem that he raised her from a lowly state to great glory as his bride. Keep that in mind, his bride. However, she betrayed God's trust and prostituted herself by seeking alliance with pagan nations and adopting their customs. If we push God aside for anything, even education, family, career, or pleasure, we are abandoning him in the same way. That's what the study Bible said. So let's think of it this way. How would you feel or how did you feel when your spouse, boyfriend or girlfriend cheated on you? A deep betrayal and trust issues developed. Some even left that person for their betrayal. Marriages have had lasting issues behind Cheating in any form, porn, talking to someone else, lunch, sex, whatever. Why should our God in his perfect form feel any different? The betrayal of a nation, he afforded grace and mercy for years, cheated on him as his bride Wow. That's going to carry consequences. As we see in Ezekiel, in marriages, relationships, and as we see today, as a nation, as the entire world, we have turned our back on God, cheated on him with our business and lust and kicking him out of schools, public platforms, jobs, our homes. Woo! He is not happy. Not only have we cheated on him, but we kicked him out of his own house. What? Out of his own house. He made this world. And when I said that, it reminds me of the movie Diary of a Mad Black Woman. When the husband would have the nerve to cheat and then moved his mistress in the house. Good God. The house that he had shared with his wife and literally threw her out in the rain with only the clothes on her back. After years of developing this man and helping him to get a thriving practice, he forgot about her and the role that she had 
in his prosperity, in his success. I'm telling you, that is a perfect visual of how possibly God feels. How it feels to be betrayed. Mm. My God, my God, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. Okay. Let's look at verse 3. And say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. So according to the study Bible, let's see what it says. Canaan was the ancient name of the territory taken over by the children of Israel. The Bible often uses this name to refer to all the corrupt pagan nations of the region. The Amorites and Hittites, two Canaanite peoples, were known for their wickedness. But here, God implies that his people are no better than the Canaanites. So they're no better than the people that everyone seems to think is wicked. That's not good. So let's go to verses 4 through 15. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloth. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Ugh, despised from birth? Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. Mm. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You were naked and bare. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Hmm, that's deep to me. You were old enough for love. So when you understood what love meant, he joined a covenant with you. Mm. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothe you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Ooh, he spared no cost. Isn't that what we do for our children? Mm. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour, honey, and olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. Wow. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. If we read further, he's not talking about vanity. Listen, because the splendor I had given you 
made your beauty perfect, declares the sovereign Lord. So what he has given us, put inside of us, made us beauty, made us beautiful inside and out. Mm. That that resonated with me. Okay. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. Wow. That is loaded. Loaded. What a descriptive visualization of God's presence, love, attentiveness, care as he grows up, grows us and this nation to be great and beautiful. Isn't that what America used to be? In some eyes. Everyone said America's great, but they misused the power that they had. Slavery, you know, different things that America has done. And there are great things in America as well. But we have misused our beauty. Mm. In verse 6, he states that I passed by and saw you kicking in your own blood. That visualization reminded me of a child being born and covered in blood and matter. Picture him cleaning that off and saying, live. He didn't leave them or us in such a vulnerable state where we surely would have died. In the infant stage, we are so vulnerable as a child, as a baby, as an infant Christian, Just coming out and learning about God, we are vulnerable and he doesn't leave us in that state. He takes care of us until he he sees us in a state that where we understand love, then he comes into a covenant with us, an agreement. And maybe we should do a study on all of God's promises as a believer but when he becomes he comes to a covenant with you you're covered he's got you and he didn't leave us in that vulnerable state Mm. and then in verse 7 he watched them he watched us grow like proud parents Like when we see our children grow up, we become proud that they are doing great things. He watches and supports them as they grow into a grown woman. Now ready to receive and understand love, he takes them as his bride. What does that mean? In the Bible, God often uses the bride, the word bride, he describes as a type of love. The church is our Lord's bride. In the Bible, for example, Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He died on the cross for the bride, which was written after death in 62 according to google and ezekiel was before christ so he had not yet died for us but 
I wanted to bring that to your attention to show that in spite of the constant abuse, he continues to love us enough to die for us. As his bride, that is a deep love. So he continues to have mercy after multiple betrayals, ultimately dying so that we can have life. So we can grow and live. That's what the bride means when that is said in the Bible. And look at verse 9 through 13. Let me go ahead and read, read that. I bathe you with water and wash the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothe you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour, honey, olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. He even gave them the best of the best to eat. As he describes how meticulously he took care of his people. He provided everything they needed. You feel it in that description. I feel the pride and the love and every detail that is written and the time spent on growing and providing for his people, for us, only to be betrayed and cheated on. Mm. I can imagine those parents who did everything for their children tried to raise them the best they can only for them to disown them, stop calling them, belittle them. Oh, how heartbreaking that must be. How heartbroken God must be to be betrayed and cheated on after everything he's provided for us. After all the love he's adorned on us. Hmm. So according to the study Bible for verse 15, let's see, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. It talks about you weren't even picky about who you gave yourself to. Some of us women need to be a little bit pickier about who we give ourselves to. Amen. So according to the study Bible, God cared for and loved Judah only to have it turn away to other nations and their false gods. They didn't do anything for them, but they turned away from the God that was doing everything to look to their false gods. The nation had grown to maturity and became famous, but it forgot who had given them their life. Wow. Just like the example with the parents and their children get older and forget about them. They've forgotten. They've forgotten who had given them their life, who carried them, who fed them when they were children in their infancy state and vulnerable and did their best to protect them and they turned their back on God this is a picture and this is the study Bible talking this is a picture of spiritual adultery called apostasy new words apostasy turning from the one true God According to Google, apostasy 
is the abandonment or renunciation of a religious or political belief. So they turned away from the one true God. And this is the study Bible now. As you become wise and more mature, don't turn away from the one who truly loves you. Wow. Let me read that again. As you become wise, as we get older, as we come, become wise and more mature, that's a good point. Just, just because you get older doesn't mean you're wise. As you become wise and more mature, don't turn away from the one who truly loves you. Oftentimes, we will replace God with another person who does not truly love us. I'm just going to let that sit there. Don't turn away. You know, we often hear about the turning away from God. People praying in their poverty as they start out. God elevates them and they give themselves the glory for all their hard work and not the one true God who put the skills in them necessary for the completion of task at hand and success, favor, positioning, finance them the entire way. Then we make it. Don't pay tithes. Don't go to church. Stop praying. Stop studying. Mm. As if we no longer need his services. Woof. As if we don't need his services anymore. It's like, okay, God, I got it now. No, you don't. No, you don't. He can definitely take what he has given you away. As many are feeling today. It is dangerous to turn your back on God. And, you know, you see a great example with the Israelites. They are going through it. And now it's our turn. Let's look at verses 16 through 19. You took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution. Such things should not happen, nor should they ever occur. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. And you took your embroidered clothes to put on them, and you offered my oil and incense before them. Doesn't that sound like regifting? Nobody wants a regift. And then you get offended when somebody re-gifts your gift. He said, and you offered my oil and incense before them. What? How dare you? Also, the food I provided for you, the fine flour, olive oil, and honey I gave you to eat, you offered as fragrant incense before them? So you just going to use my stuff to get in with someone else. Who has not done half as much as I've done for you? Not good. Not a good look. You offered as fragrant incense before them. That is what happened, declares the sovereign Lord. Hmm. Interesting. Ending with, I love the ending. Ending with, that is what happened. So he ended with, that is what happened. He broke it down for them just in case they didn't know what they did. Kind of like when your parents whoop you and talk to you the entire time about what you did. (laughs) He said, and that is what happened. 
almost daring you to, to say, no, it didn't. Okay, verses 20 through 21. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children. My gosh. You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. In all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your blood. Wow. Say so what? Okay, let's let's get to the study Bible on this. It says child sacrifice had been practiced by the Canaanites. Now I see why the Canaanites were seen as wicked. Child sacrifice had been practiced by the Canaanites long before Israel invaded their land, but it was strictly forbidden by God. That is his creation. By Ezekiel's time, however, the people were openly sacrificing their own children. Jeremiah confirmed that this was a common practice in Jeremiah 7, 31, 32 and 35. 7, 31 and 32 and 35. Because of such vile acts among the people and the priesthood, the temple became unfit for God to inhabit. When God left the temple, he was no longer Judah's guide and protector. Hmm. Unbelievable. It sounds like a movie. Sacrificing children. In 22, he states, you did not remember your youth. When you were naked and bare, kicking in your blood. Him saying, you forgot what I brought you out of. Where you started. Or like most say, where you came from. You forgot where you came from. My God, my God. They truly did. They're over there sacrificing children. Goodness. Okay, let's continue. 22 through 26. In all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked, bare, kicking about in your blood. Woe to you, declares the sovereign Lord. In addition to all your other wickedness, you built a mound for yourself and made a lofty shrine in every public square. Wow. Uh, something just came to me, so I, that's why I'm pausing. But the Spirit says, is telling me, you built a mound for yourself and made a lofty shrine in every public square. So imagine every public square, they built a mound. So they were busy at work but it wasn't for the work of God. So what happens here? All of this work that they done that they had did was for nothing. All this work was for nothing. It actually made their life worse. That's that's what we we need to look at today. We find ourselves so busy every day, moving about our day without asking God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to focus on today? And we're busy and we're busy and we're overwhelmed and bills aren't getting paid and wondering why we're not making any money and wondering why we're not getting this done. Because it's just that. It's just busy work without purpose. You got to give him something to work with. He will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. But what are you doing for him? 
You can't just take, take, take. You have to give back. You have to plant seeds in order for him to water it. You have to start moving in order for him to open the door. You got to get to the door. Wow. So they did all this work. Okay, I'm going to move on. That was 24, but I'm going to read it again. You built a mound for yourself <laughs> and made a lofty shrine in every public square. Yourself, that selfish intent. I want, I want to do this. Well, I want to do this. God is telling you not to do it because he knows better. He has something better. But Lord, I want to be with him. I want to be with this married man. He's already taken. He's got something better for you. Something that you can call your own. You don't have to prostitute yourself. Well, God, I want to work at this place. That's not where he wants you to be. He wants you to start over here. Even though it seems a lower level, he has something better for you. You don't have to prostitute yourself at that other job. Working and slaving yourself for minimal pay when he said, come over here and I'll provide for you. And then I will give you more. Stop playing. Stop playing. Okay, 25. At the head of every street, you built your lofty shrines and degraded your beauty, offering your body with increasing promiscuity, promiscuity to anyone who passed by. <laughs> Just throwing yourself. That's the sign of desperation. You engaged in prostitution with Egyptians, your lustful neighbors and provoked me to anger with your increasing promiscuity. Yeah, I could see how he could get angry. I definitely could. So listen, provoking me to anger, God said, and provoked me to anger with your increasing promiscuity. Have you ever been provoked to anger? Woo! It takes everything in you not to react. You continually tell that person, don't test me. Warning after warning. Oof. I'm having a flashback. Sorry. That is a buildup. And they tried him. They tried him in Ezekiel. As we, as a nation, as the people of God have tried him as well to this date. Why? Oh, he's not coming back. Oh, I have time. We make excuse after excuse, ex excuse except for his faithful few. Except for his faithful few. They're not going to try him. I'm not trying him. Mm -mm. I'm taking him at his word in the name of Jesus. Okay. Verse 27. So I stretched out my hand against you and reduced your territory. What? I gave you over to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were shocked by your lewd conduct. Okay, let's talk about the Philistines. So according to the study Bible, the conduct of the Jews was so lewd that even those who worshipped other gods, the Philistines worshipped other gods, including their great enemy, the Philistines, would have been ashamed to behave that way. Jews outdid them in doing evil. Wow, they outdid them, huh? Listen to what he says. 
he reduces their territory. That is huge. Listen, took their land and he will do that to us and us as a nation. He will do that and has reduced the territory of those who disobey or disrespect him. Reduce how much money you make. Lose your house, car, friends, your influence. Keep doing what you want to do and he will reduce your territory. It happened then and it can happen today. It's happening today. We better stop playing. The value of America's dollar is being reduced in value in other countries. Our influence is being reduced. Okay. He's decreasing our territory. As a, as a nation, a country, the world, as people, and in the scripture, in Ezekiel. Verse 28, you engaged in prostitution with the Assyrians too because you were insatiable. That is a huge hunger, desire. And even after that, you still were not satisfied. Hmm. And so they tried to influence more and more, increasing their territory to do what they do. To me, building for the devil. If you're against God, you're doing the devil's work. That of the wicked. You hear me? If you're not doing God's will, you're doing the work of the devil. You're furthering his kingdom and not God's kingdom. And you are on the wrong side. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. We haven't even finished all of chapter 16 because it's fairly long. But there is so much in there. So many deep layers. So I will see you on part two. And again, if you are a couple, join us on the podcast. You can say that again. And always remember, God deserves our praise, worship, and glory. Yesterday, today, and forever. Be blessed, be covered, stay safe out there. There's a lot of places opening right now. I pray that you would just use and listen to your spirit on how you should protect your family. Have a blessed day.